forgetful. So um, I'd like to introduce the moderator for the panel discussion, Marg Alfieri. Marg is the founder of the Family Health Team's Registered Dietitians. She is a clinical dietitian at the Center for Family Medicine and an associate professor at McMaster University. Today, she will be moderating the panel discussion, so please join me in welcoming Mark. Thank you. So you guys ready for some fun? Okay. It's going to be a lot of fun, but we need to have a lively dialogue, and those of you who know me, I'm going to insist on lively. The dialogue's not just among us in the room to ask questions of our panelists, but also from the webcast as well. So I already have some questions on my BlackBerry. Two que no, someone sent a few questions. And thank you for those who sent me the uh, politically incorrect jokes. That they were quite amusing. So thank you for that. <laughs> so, OK, so we have lots and lots of questions. So why don't we start? Are there any questions from the audience first? We're done? Are you, are you buying beer? <laughs> now, is that a functional food? Uh, are you taking it? It has our, function. It has, much, <laughs> it has much function. OK. Actually, it's amazingly nutritious. Yes, you don't need your B vitamins, do you? Yeah. A cup of Guinness is all you need. Yeah, you're nodding. You agree. OK, Len, I can always count on you. Hi, um, I'm Len Pichet, um, University of Western Ontario, Brescia University College. Um, got a couple questions, and I'm sure there's going to be more come up as we, we go along, but um, I, I guess I'll start off with Kim, with you, mm -hmm. if, if you don't mind. Uh, and I get this a lot, too, during lectures. The students are always asking, and this is mostly dietitians, uh, would-be dietitians in our program. And so when we tell them about biotechnology and, and so on, uh, one of the first questions that comes up, and I, I think I might have the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you, um, is how many, um, you know, biotechnology type foods do we have on our market uh, in Canada? Well, right now, the biotech crops that are approved for, for being grown are corn, canola, and, and soybeans. Those are the ones that are approved. So how, how many foods? Oh, here okay. I was. I was thinking so, somebody had, had you had changed your voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was kind of like, okay, what happened here? <laughs> so, as far to my knowledge, those are the three that are are and, and foods made from that those products are the what's on the market today. I'm not aware of any others, and and if somebody can tell me differently, I'd be happy to. Okay, no, that's fine, and I know they're in lots of foods, and, and most of us have eaten most of those foods. Uh, but maybe, John, maybe you can tell us how many varieties of, you know, different corn or soybeans. If you add them all up, how many would there be, like BT corn and, well, and so you, on? All right. You, you have to look at where all these products go, right? So mo most of the corn actually does not go into direct human food. It goes into animal feed, right? So you have to differentiate be between whether it's animal feed or whether it's human food. And the, and the varieties of corn that are used for that are, are different. So when, when you look at uh, whether it's BT corn or Roundup Ready corn or Liberty Link corn, those are all input trait uh, corns that go into pig feed, they go into dairy feed, into beef cattle feed. And you have to understand the, the biology that when, when you move something like that, you're just moving another protein source or another carbohydrate source into, the, into these things. So, um, and then the, the other uses of things like canola and soybeans, uh, you know, canola oil, soybean oil, there's no protein in, in those oils, uh, but they are products of, uh, of biotechnology, of, of genetic uh, modification, right? So uh, when you look at the proportion of soybeans in Ontario or in Canada that are genetically modified, things like 80% mm -hmm. or 85%, uh, corn is 70%, uh, canola is probably 90%, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, but most of those are input traits. So, uh, and most of it goes to, uh, like I said, livestock feed or industrial uses. Except for the new li high lysine corn now, right? Yeah, the, uh, well, the high lysine corn, again, would also be for animal feed, right? Uh, mostly for pigs. But if it makes it into our food supply, we're not, not, we shouldn't worry about it. What no. I'm, okay, no, good. No, you shouldn't worry about that. Excellent. That's good to know. And um, 
Colin, I, I've got a question for you too, and this has to do with you know your talk on sodium. And I was glad to see you brought in not just uh, meats, but bread and uh, dairy too. And so maybe just to remind us um, how much of our sodium in our diet is coming from where? Well, a substantial portion is coming from meats and bread. Uh, I think in total, um, probably about 24, 25% between those two right there. So clearly 70% of the sodium is coming from processed foods. And, and within that, and bread would be the two largest contributors. And then it progressively gets lower from there. So, so everybody is not all coming from soup, right? I <laughs> know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Colin, I have a question. I was talking to Willie uh, Hubert, who is the owner, or was the owner of Pillars Food. He just sold it in August. And he just uh, is opening up a new meat plant in Arthur. I don't know the technical term, but only to produce the lower sodium. So I'm like, Willie, way to go. We can finally, you know, we, you know as Kim, as dietitians, we're like, well, you got to watch your sodium. What are we going to do? Is there a big cost to reducing the sodium? Well, there is potentially a cost because, you know, when we talk about moistness and succulence, mm -hmm. if you kind of back it off into the production cycle, mm -hmm. that's about the ability to hold on to moisture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, the implication is that you could have one, two, three percent, three percent lower um, yield, and that will impact the cost of the product. So, so that could be bad news for our consumers. We're telling them to have the low-sodium products, but if they cost more... It is likely to cost more. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, to me, if the consumer wants it, mm -hmm. right, and I presume they're prepared, therefore, to pay appropriately mm -hmm. for it. And that, that's whether it's functional foods or, mm -hmm. or anything, right? There, there's there there's there's trade-offs. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There are costs associated with these things. Mm -hmm. so. I agree. A question from the audience. Hi, my name is Angela Liuzzo, and I'm a registered dietitian. I have a question. I don't know if it's for Kim or Dr. Dr. Kelly, but um, my experience is that consumers, in terms of biotechnology, are more concerned about transfer of genes from one species to another, so like from an animal to like a tomato. Um, and I understand that's probably more like genetic engineering, which I think still falls under biotechnology. Uh -huh. Can you explain um, the difference and whether or not we actually have um, genetic engineering in Canada or if it's something that is coming? Okay, well, genetic, I guess genetic modification or genetic engineering is what we've done, I, I think, and you can correct me, Dr. Kelly, to the corn and the canola and the, uh, uh, and the soybeans where we've taken a specific, specific trait that we wanted, specific gene, we've modified it, and then we've changed the corn or the soy or the canola. Um, so that is genetic modification. Um, I actually think that's a lot safer than doing it Mendel's way where we hoped we were changing one gene, but maybe we were changing five, six, seven, who knows? Now at least we know exactly what we're doing, um, not hit or miss. Um, however, I'm not aware that we have any of the uh, introducing any animal genes to plants. No, the uh, the source of the genes that you have in in canola or soybeans or uh, uh, the corn, they're they're uh, of bacteriological origin. So you don't have the you know nobody's taking an animal gene putting it into a plant. That's just not happening. And, and the thing about uh, uh, genetic engineering, it's very targeted. And that's the one thing that people miss when they, when they talk about uh, uh, development of these products. So if you're going to develop uh, a corn plant and you want to develop resistance to uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is the BT, right? Uh, or you want to have a Bacillus thuringiensis plant. To do that through conventional breeding, you'll go and modify hundreds and hundreds of genes to get one trait. And you may, you may get what you want, but you may not get what you want, and there could be other uh, implications beyond what you've already done. So by using a targeted uh, approach to uh, uh, genetics, and that's what really genetic engineering is, uh, they're able to take a specific gene for a specific trait and, and, and modify it for that specific output. So, like, people get confused with the term biotechnology, but as I was talking up here, you know, biotechnology is biological technologies. 
And genetic engineering is of just one of many, many, many bio biological technologies that are at our disposal. And I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, 50 years ago, uh, when artificial insemination came into the dairy business, people were going, oh my goodness, you can't do that. You know, but now uh, artificial insemination is a, a general practice for, uh, for the dairy business, right? And, it, and it's actually a, a very uh, great way to ex extend our, our superior Canadian genetics around the world, right? So uh, part of it is uh, understanding technology. You have to also understand the, uh, the degree of regulatory scrutiny that uh, is done for genetically engineered products, and it's, it's intense. Uh, I, I've done... Uh, uh, in the past, I've been involved with uh, regulatory affairs on, on GM products, and I'll tell you, the, the dossiers that we had to put in would fill this room, right? It's just that much work, right? So it's, it's not something where you say, oh, I think I'll do this, and, and a year later you'll have it. It's, it just doesn't work that way. Thank you. Uh, a question from someone from the webcast. They said, thank you to all the panelists for an excellent presentation. Um, the two questions for you, Colin. The first one is, can you provide the substances Chinese restaurants use to make their meat so tender? Question one. The, the question is, what do they use? Mm -hmm. um, they use um, bicarbonate of soda, mm -hmm. and that, that's one, one approach. Mm -hmm. And I was just informed by somebody else that uh, they use sometimes soy sauce mm -hmm. and salt, I think is uh, what Sue, Sue told me. Starch. So the, the idea basically was to hold on to a lot more moisture. That, that, that was the principle. Right. Right? So does cornstarch help the moisture? I don't know. No. But it's just used. Okay, cool. Okay. But I think, Sue, what you were suggesting, it may be the salt of the, of, of the soy sauce, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, question two is, uh, I'll, I'll read it direct. I, oh. My son's calling me. Whoops. Um, <laughs> he better not be in trouble. I'm a long way away. Um, I saw there are some companies making natural ham without the nitrates as preservatives. I wonder what food company um, is actually using to preserve the ham. Well, I think that's targeted at, at, at our company, I'm sure. Um, the predominant preservation mm -hmm. system associated with that product is mm -hmm. a combination of lemon juice, concentrate, mm -hmm. and vinegar. Right. And it's right there on the label. Mm -hmm. Wow, cool. So I'm, for those of you who know that product, is it lower in salt? Because that's the whole thing. I mean, it's nice, no? It, well, hold it's on. The same? I mean, it depends upon what you characterize as lower in salt. Mm -hmm. Those products were created to mm -hmm. meet the anticipated 2016 mm -hmm. um, guidelines, mm -hmm. health kind of guidelines mm -hmm. for, for sodium. Okay. Okay, so they were created with that intent in mind. Okay, and those are the 1,500 milligrams per day? Is anyone here from Health Canada? Well, no. Um, no. Mark, if, if, okay. if, I could, if I could explain. Yes. There are specific targets associated with specific categories. I think for mm -hmm. sliced meats, it's, I don't know, maybe 870, 890 mm -hmm. milligrams in that vicinity mm -hmm. uh, per 100 milligrams. Okay. And so the products that we have created meet those requirements. Excellent. Okay. It's going to help now, our practice. Does that, does, the modeling that Health Canada did mm -hmm. suggested that if all of the guidelines were followed, mm -hmm. that we would be able to get to 23, 2400 milligrams okay. by 2060. Ultimately, mm -hmm. they would like to get to 1500. Mm -hmm. okay. So 1500 is okay. down the road. Good. Well, we applaud your, you know, your efforts as, as a corporation because dietitians, I mean, we're, we're tra constantly telling people to reduce their salt. Very difficult if we don't have delicious foods. You can't tell them to eat sawdust. It isn't no. going to work. So, yes, yeah, so thank you. Ta and good we tasting and meat. we don't want to produce sawdust either. No, so. you won't make it. Your uh, return on investment will be quite poor. <laughs> a question. Hi, it's Katie Jessup. I uh, really enjoyed all of your presentations. Thank you. I have two questions. The first one is for Colin. Um, I'm wondering how much of the sodium that we see in these meats is from salt and how much it is from um, other additives like sodium phosphate, sodium erythorbate, et cetera. Um, most of it is, is from sodium chloride, right? I mean, the, the level of sodium of the phosphate that one might use is, is going to be less than half a percent. And if you recall from at least the, the graphs, you're looking typically at sort of a two-ish or 2.5% or sodium chloride. So you can see it's almost like a five-fold difference. The amount of sodium erythorbate is in the order of 500 parts per million. So the major contributor 
of sodium is associated with sodium chloride. Thank you. Um, and for the other two, uh, I, I'm not trying to be a uh, survivalist, but I have been reading quite a bit about the seven billion, um, and I do wonder about the um, the numbers that have been presented around increasing the food supply by a certain percentage in order to meet this population. How possible you feel it, it might actually be? Well, I I think that um, this meeting that demand is really one of the questions and one of the reasons why we have to look very carefully at biotechnology and and how we are producing our food. Um, it's kind of interesting because as a dietitian, I never really thought much about it actually till I came here a couple of years ago and I spoke mm -hmm. to some farmers and they were talking to me about all the different challenges they had and I kind of went, oh, that never occurred to me that that might even be a challenge that you had to meet, that there was going to be less land available, that there are more mouths to feed and it was getting harder to do. Um, I don't know if we'll ever be able to do it uh, and be totally self-sustained, um, not importing any food. I really don't know if we'll be able to do it. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons why we all have to strongly look toward biotechnology to help us to do that. From a, from a global perspective, our issue currently is more transportation and, and distribution than it is food production. Uh, for 2050, when the rec, you know, the, it's assumed that we're going to have 9 billion people here, uh, we have lots of other challenges as, uh, to do with this. Uh, you know, there isn't going to be any more land. We know that for sure. Uh, you might see some marginal. Uh, increases in, in land in South America when people take out the rainforest, but that's, that's built with other challenges. So we, ha we have other issues, I think, which are going to be more pressing uh, for us in, in production, and that's going to be water. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have, you know, I was part of a, an Ag Canada foresight group, and the, the challenges that uh, the southern hemisphere uh, uh, countries are going to have uh, are going to be really quite large. Uh, with global warming, what will happen is countries like Russia, Canada, uh, the Scandinavian countries, they'll actually probably do okay because it'll, it'll be better for our production. But uh, we'll see bigger swings in, in, uh, in the weather and, and those types of things. But generally, we should, we should see increases in production uh, in, in our areas. But places like Australia, China, India, where they're going to need lots and lots more food. They're going to be struck with lots of production challenges, and mostly due to water. Thank you. Now, this distinguished gentleman. <laughs> Hi, it's Gary Freed. Uh, I'm a consultant in the food industry. Uh, just to add on to that, your responses, there is, uh, uh, the, the numbers out are that while we're expected to hit 9 billion by 2050, which is a 28% increase, the consumption numbers are projected to be a minimum 50% increase, and some uh, sources are saying as high as 70% mm -hmm. because there will be higher disposable income in uh, developing countries. So we may have to increase our food consumption by 70% over that 40 years. Now, interestingly enough, can we do it? Uh, some statistics that I uncovered recently, Canada has the, th the third highest land per capita, productive agricultural land per capita mm -hmm. in the world after Australia and Kazakhstan. And we have the third highest fresh water per capita in the world after, of all places, Greenland and the Congo. And uh, if anybody has the opportunity to meet that need or to contribute Absolutely. in a major way to it, we do, but an awful lot of of new ideas and new technologies and new approaches are going to be required. There was just, and I'll finish up with one last comment, there was a, just a report issued about three weeks ago from a team of about 15 researchers around the world asking the question, can we feed 9 billion people without ruining our natural resources? The conclusion they came to was yes, but there were a lot of uh, sustainability rated issues that needed to be addressed if we're to do that. It's a, it's a very worthwhile report to look at and I can't even think of the source of it right yep. now, but anyway, thank you. <laughs> the, the, the point about affluence is, is important. If you look at uh, both China and India, uh, 
uh, when countries become more affluent, their, con their consumption of uh, meat and dairy products yes. increases. And when that happens, it, it takes more uh, crop more to land, feed yeah. animals to right. feed humans right. than it does to feed crop directly to humans. Right. Well, and the other factor is we're taking more and more agricultural land and using it for production of non-food related mm -hmm. items that's, too. That, that's, that's, that's another challenge. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we had another question, and it was Allison. It's whether everyone was raving. We had some raves about your presentation. Want to know if a PDF of it can be distributed? A PDF of your presentation, but maybe that's something that you can talk to Lois about and, and Hillary about the thing. And the kernel of what you said, knowledge transfer, all the way through your presentations was resonating with me. Um, Kim and I had a sort of a semi-hallway bathroom conversation about dietitians not knowing about food. And I thought, I, came, I have come back from here with four new things that I didn't know about. So how are we going to be telling people about the new, you know, the transformations in our food industry? functional foods. Even my son was reading my stuff and he goes, you're going to talk about tomatoes with growing heads that, you know, revolve because, you know, the biotech. How are we, as all health professionals, we are tasked with telling, you know, not only our patients but our consumers and our families, we need to have a good communication channel so that we will be getting the information out. Okay. So that's something you need to be thinking about. Well, we'll go to the next question. Hi, my name is Siva Swaminathan. I'm a chef and I cook for a living. And I also talk about um, what one of the questions, uh, my question is for uh, John. Um, I'm always talking about to my students about eating that's things that are local and healthier in terms of when you talked about salmon is wild salmon versus farm, farm salmon. And the thing that you had talked about was aqua advantage salmon versus non-transgenic salmon and growth. Could you talk to me a little bit about that, or to, to everyone, please? Sure. Um, and I, I, I purposefully put that slide in there to try and engage some, <laughs> some dialogue. Uh, got my so. Yeah, that's good. Uh, there there are, are a number of different transgenic animals that are being developed. There are none that are on the market. Uh, the only transgenic animal that's approved by the FDA is uh, a, a goat, which produces a, uh, a pharmaceutical called Atrin. Right. So uh, from an agricultural perspective, there are uh, really, a, there, there aren't very many, but there are things like the aqua uh, bounty salmon. And that aqua bounty salmon uh, is a Canadian technology now based in the U.S. Uh, and basically the way it works is they, they have, it's, it's where you have a, a, a gene which isn't silenced. So in other words, what happens is the, the, the aqua bounty salmon uh, continues to uh, produce its own growth hormone uh, throughout its ent entire life, whereas in, in a conventional salmon what happens is they, it shuts down after, I don't, I don't know how, how long, but it, it shuts down maybe half of its age or something like that. So that's what, that's what allows the salmon to, to grow uh, faster, right, and that, that's, the, that's the real advantage. Uh, the, uh, the company that does it has done, again, all, all of the different types of studies that have to be done to, to meet uh, the FDA requirements. And, and they'll go through the FDA first. Uh, if, if you follow the way uh, the FDA regulates uh, any of these products, they have a, a program called the Ziggurat program. And basically, it, it's, a, it's a pyramid of nine different steps. And within each of these steps, there are, you know, you have to be able to, to show environmental toxi toxicity, human toxicity, benefits the animal, uh, phenotype, uh, genotype, all, all that stuff. So there's, there's a, a ton of science that goes into, into these things. I know that uh, uh, the aqua bounty salmon has gone through uh, several layers of, of the ziggurat, uh, but it's, it's not there yet, right? Uh, same with the uh, enviro pig, uh, which is a, a, a pig which uh, essentially reduces the phosphorus effluent in, uh, in uh, manure. Right, so it's going through the ziggurat process too, but currently uh, it's not registered for uh, for consumption, and it it does have to go through the food feed environment uh, approvals as well. Uh, so, but the U.S. market will be the first target market. Thank you. So bigger is better. Well, when 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 you think about uh, our fish supplies, they're dwindling. <laughs> yes. Right. So we're, these fish are growing faster, so it makes it mm -hmm. more efficient. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, can we grow them in uh, in tanks? Mm -hmm. Maybe. 
Is there any any difference uh, in the in the structure of the fish? No. Okay. Good. Right. So that's that's and that's one of the things they have to show. Good. Question. Hi, I'm Colleen Smith. I'm the executive director of Ontario Agri-Food Education. And we try and get all this information to the school system. So it's a big mandate because everything's changing so often. So what I always look for is a whole picture. And one thing I'm always surprised to see that, that seems to be neglected, because I've been to many food conferences on sovereignty and security and so on, is our real problem of waste management when it comes to food. There are some comments out there, and we did a panel here last year at the Royal, actually, where a young health professional presented stats to say that we could probably feed 9 billion people today if we didn't waste the food we waste, and that for every portion of food we have, there's a portion wasted. So of course, we have transportation and delivery that you've, you've all talked about. But I'm wondering why that gets sidetracked so much, and in a room of of all of us who are concerned about healthy eating and the obesity rates and the health issues that obesity is causing. I'm wondering why when we talk about farm production we concentrate on that instead of including an ability to manage the food we shamelessly, absolutely shamelessly waste every day in North America. So I'd like your, just some general comments on that, please. Who wants to start? Okay, I'll, I'll start. From, from a holistic perspective, uh, you remember the slide that I put up of connecting the farmer to the consumer, right? So uh, along that entire chain, everybody has to uh, be profitable. That's the first thing. So the farmers have to be profitable. The uh, people who, who collect and aggregate and, and sell have to be profitable. Uh, we have to meet the requirements of, of the government when it comes to food safety. So we'll, we'll see some wastage uh, due to food safety issues. Uh, we, we also have uh, uh, consumer choice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when the consumer decides to buy a product, whatever it is, that's their, their free choice to, to buy that product. Um, when it comes to uh, products that, that either spoil or, or go bad, well, there's liability issues if, the, if those products are served, right? So uh, we, we, we probably need to find better ways for our distribution systems. Uh, the buy local uh, program will help with, with some of that because then you'll have a direct farmer-consumer uh, interaction, but that's not going to feed the entire population, right? So we are we're going to be dependent upon things like food preservation technologies uh, to, to make things last longer. And whether it's GM or uh, other types of products, like maybe the things that Colin is working on, those are the things we have to develop. So long if I mm -hmm. could, you know, I, I think we as consumers have the ultimate vote. Mm -hmm. You vote mm -hmm. with your pocketbook, right? So you don't buy supersized products. Mm -hmm. If they if they are not purchased, they disappear. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's the cycle of of yeah. of consumerism, right? You buy it. More is made. You don't buy it, it's stopped. Mm -hmm. It's stopped. I, to me, I think we all mm -hmm. have a role to play in voting with our pocketbook. I agree. I agree. And I think mm -hmm. I think we know that more and more meals are consumed in, in restaurants and in food service, and I think that's one of the, the places where I see the most waste. If, mm -hmm. if my clients are actually doing what I'm asking them to do and only eat half of the food that's on the plate, well, where's the other half going? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think we have to address those kind of issues, and I don't. I've never seen anybody leave a restaurant because the f the amount of food that was served was too big. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm sure if enough of us did that, then they'd start Absolutely. figuring out how to make the portions yeah. smaller. But nobody does. I, I also think <laughs> yeah. in that chain, that supply chain you had, I really think it's important to get the health professionals talking to the farmers, um, because I know that we have a real challenge. If I really actually got all my clients eating all the fruits and vegetables that they were supposed to, I don't know if we could produce that many. Yeah. And I don't know, <clears throat> under the current situation, if we could produce enough fish to have all my clients eating their portions of fish that they're supposed to. So I think we have to get the dietitians and the health professionals involved in that, because if it's one thing for us to be telling, asking our clients to do something, but it's another thing if agriculture is not, you right. know, kind of. So, so with, within, that, within that value chain, that, that was the linear part, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
there are there are other parts that influence each part of that value chain. Dietitians being one, health professionals mm -hmm. being another, regulatory mm -hmm. impacting every step of the chain, right? Every step of the chain, uh, right from uh, what the farmers have to do to do it, to mm -hmm. how you manufacture, to how people sell the product. Okay. Right. So. Uh, that linear chain is certainly there, but there are other key yeah. influencers of it. Okay, and, and we really thank you. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna. We have we have time. We have two. We have two minutes. We have a time for a quip and a question. Okay, the the question builds on this and is directed at Colum. I mean, one of the one of the thing we always focus on post consumer waste. We forget that there's waste at all levels of the value chain yep. in a, in a very major way. I know that Maple Leaf is working on the whole. Uh, lean uh, approach within their organization. Can you tell me the impact that that's having as far as eliminating waste, and what if we could extend that up and down the value chain? I'm not too sure, Gary, that I can I could talk specifically about that, but I'll give you one example of of what one has to do. Right. So, you know, everybody knows that we've just announced the closure of a couple of plants recently. Well. If you think about it in a very linear fashion, if I have three plants making wieners, I'm generating a percentage waste from each of those associated with yields and so on. If I could consolidate all of that manufacture in one location and if I can still have the shelf life that I can service a 10,000 kilometer wide distribution chain, my percentage waste, typical production waste, on a larger on a on a larger volume because of the efficiencies is going to be significantly less right so there's this on one hand we have buy local and i understand you know 100 kilometer and so on there's there's merit in that but there's also merit in terms of consolidating your manufacturing so that you become more efficient so that you can generate less waste okay so that doesn't exactly answer the question, Gary, okay. but uh, you know that's at least one of the things mm -hmm. we're doing. Yeah. Like Gary, let me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But maybe you guys could have a beer and talk about it, yeah. Yeah. and then buy me one. But I'll be drinking on the 401. Last My question. My name is we Carol Colhane. I have a question yeah. for Colm. But first, I want to talk about access to information on biotechnology-derived foods, um, which is regulated as a novel food in Canada under Division 28. Health Canada maintains a list of all of the uh, novel foods they have approved. And that includes genetically modified crops. The first was the uh, flavor saver tomato in 94. So they've been keeping this list for 17 years. And there's about 100 plus there. So you can access that. Um, also, when the CFIA has approved a field assessment, um, they uh, release that information on a listserv. They don't let you know about it whenever they're conducting the trial, of course. So there is access to that information. Um, my question for Colin. Um, are your consumers though, of your company, Maple Leaf, are they asking for sodium reduced foods? And let's say even though they aren't vocally asking for them, and we know about the health effects of too much sodium, would you be voluntarily slowly reducing the sodium of, of your foods? Why or why not? I'll deal with the, the, the first question. They're asking for the product, but they're typically not purchasing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, Okay, so I said they're asking for it, but typically not purchasing it. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. We've had a salt-reduced bacon f in the market for probably 20 years, and it still probably is no more than 20%, 15 to 20% of our, our bacon volume. It's been out there, it's been promoted, it's been advertised not any longer, but originally, but then people, when they purchase it, they say, that's not what I want out of my bacon, right? So yes, they ask for it, but they don't purchase it. I think, though, um, over time, you, and, you know, many, many examples, they say if there's slow reduction, people get accustomed to it. Um, with with the, the guidelines that Health Canada um, have, will put into place fairly soon, um, I believe that most of those, and I'm only talking about the meat business now, are truly achievable. I, I honestly believe that. With some challenges, you know, in terms of yield and so forth and so on, what I cannot predict is what the flavor impact is going to be and therefore what the consumer acceptance is going to be. That's a little bit more difficult to predict. I mean, all of the technical things, you can, you know, it's 1% yield difference, et cetera, et cetera, you know, there's, 
you know, 10 days of, of, of listeria protection lost, et cetera. But what I cannot predict is the consumer response to, the, to that product. Mm -hmm. So will your waste go up? Um, yeah, it may. I, actually, consumer waste could go up. It may. Yeah. And I need, Lois told me I must be on time. So I want to thank the panelists. Uh, your presentations are amazing. The, the dialogue w was great. So thank you for the questions from the audience and from the webcast. So thank you very much. Thank you.